Hello, you. Let me ask you something. Why haven't you subscribed to Class Horrorcast yet? Huh? Do you think I'm not gonna notice? Well, I see everything. Can you remember you your, your gateway right into, <laughs> I guess, horror? The question is, like, should or, you subscribe you know, to Class Horrorcast or, magic or, or not? In general? The question is, did yeah, I just I mean, subscribe you? The, in terms of horror, it's going to definitely Now enjoy the show. I'll be short watching. It is the, like the Pan Book of Horror collections. And then there was a an editor. So these all, I found all these Welcome things to in of class the library. I'm your host, Aaron. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the town where I grew up. And there was an editor called Peter Haney, From a young age, Nicholas and I used to love his collections of short stories and his introductions to them. Um, it's going to be authors like H.H. H. H. Munro, Nicholas otherwise known as Saki, S A K I. He wrote each, and he specialised in these really, really, literally four-page short stories. Um, I really enjoyed those. Um, those were the definite. Uh, in terms of horror, that's kind of you where it started. But then, again, I, then I was making 2012. model kits Since then, of the Universal short films, um, Glow in the Dark Aurora model kits, because we're talking the 1970s here. Which is and in then, in, uh, in terms of horror films, of I'm a big fan of films. You know, remember being mm-hmm. taken to the he cinema to see Tenderfoot. I think it was a really unknown Disney film. It was probably the first film I ever saw. In the cinema, I'm being blown Barnaby's away by that. And then um, and they showed the, the Universal horror films on BBC Two Join late at night on the Fridays. The and and well, yeah, the Universal and the Roger Corman, Vincent Price, Edgar Allan Poe films. So those those were all the, the kind of the culmination of things. Yeah, getting it. so really from a young age. I mean, early teens. If not before, I was interested in horror. Oh, and reading Dennis Wheatley books, mm-hmm. all the ne- Dennis Wheatley novels, which of course were filmed by Hammer with Christopher Plummer playing the Duke de Richelieu of the top of my, I may have his name wrong, but anyway, I remember him playing that in The Devil's The Devil Rides Out. Um, so yeah, all those kind of things. Uh, and would you say... I guess from a, a young age, maybe teens, that you realised it was something you wanted to be involved in. Yeah, I mean, I was I was acting from a very young age, and when I say from a very young age, I mean primary school. I any chance I could get, I was really into it, and mm-hmm. all through my teens and my early twenties, before I went to drama school, I was doing amateur, produ- amateur productions. Um, theater. Obviously not, I mean, none of those were horror. Those were all historical or mm-hmm. Alan Bennett comedies or things like that. So, yeah, I did lots and lots of that as much as in terms of acting and always wanted to be an actor, not necessarily an actor in horror films. That really came about through my friendship with Clive Barker. But, yeah, so that's kind of the, that story. <laughs> and, and what do you think that was that... Um that kind of pulled you into that world? What was it that made you want to perform and and do these kind of things? I always say I was a terrible Um, (laughs) show-off. I... I, I, It just felt natural to me. It Mm -hmm. just felt fascinating to me. I... don't know that we can... Yeah, I I mean, I've said before that it, it is... something. People who want to perform just want to perform we feel we probably feel happier being the center of attention Mm -hmm. which sounds terrible and very arrogant um but i guess it's kind of true we you know there is nothing like being on stage and hearing applause yeah uh there is nothing i do not know of any other kind of experience that is just being in front of a group of people and knowing that you are communicating with them. Mm -hmm. That to me is the real drug is the fact that you have, it's not just communicating with one person, you have communication with lots of people. And I think that was the thing that really attracted me. And obviously that's slightly different when you're doing films uh, because it it kind of feels really cold because there is no audience there. But yeah, it was, it's 
Um, what, my, what one of my drama teachers said was the urge to communicate. The um, the real, I have to, I have this idea in my head and I think it's really important and I have to explain it to you. And I think that's part, you know, probably what's at the back of it. Yeah, I could see that. I guess nowadays, looking back, you know, a lot of aspiring actors or fans of film, especially horror in general, would look back, you know, at something as iconic as the Hellraiser franchise and kind of be, uh, I, I guess, blown away by the fact that, you know, you're you're doing these, you're you're doing these plays and you're on stage and different things like that. And then you go from that to something like Hellraiser and you're like this iconic character. Now that we look back on it, how, I know you've probably told this story a million times, but maybe the, the simple uh, layman's version, like it seems like such a crazy transition to go from that to, you know, I'm one of these iconic characters in this massive franchise. You're absolutely right. It is a crazy thing. And I think, as I said before, it's kind of all, it's just, it's Clive's fault. <laughs> it was his idea. <laughs> I just went along with the game, you know, because mm-hmm. I'd known Clive for three years before we made Hellraiser. I was already modeling for Clive. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'd become very close friends beforehand. I mean, in, in fact if you look at all the Cenobites um, Grace uh, who plays a female Cenobite in the first film was Clive's cousin Doug had known Clive since they were teenagers and at school together Simon Bamford although he was in the same drama same year at drama school as me had already worked with Clive Mm -hmm. and knew Clive already through working with the dog company and It is kind of crazy. You're absolutely right. I don't, we were never aware at the time. I don't think I, I, we knew Clive was brilliant. You know, he had the books of blood to publish. Stephen King had said the famous quote, I've seen the future of horror. His name is Clive Barker. All that had happened. So we, I think all of us knew perhaps that he was a really fascinating Mm -hmm. guy doing something completely different uh, in terms of what horror was, you know, and certainly British independent horror was at the time. There was nothing like Hellraiser. So, yeah, I, it's, it's Clive's fault, really, is it's the just, short lady's answer. It's just, um, you know, the more I think about it, the more, I guess, surreal it seems, and I can't imagine what it must be like for you now. You know, without without um, trying to sound too big headed or whatever, or blow smoke. But it, it, it's got to be crazy to look back at that now and 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 see like that you're this beloved character that people seem to constantly bring back and be like, you know, can we would we ever see him again? I'm sure you get asked a million times, could we ever see you back as him again? Is there anything we could ever do? Would Clive put his hands back into the IP again? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's publicly known that in terms of Clive being involved again, I think it's publicly known, A, they've done a reboot of Hellraiser with a female pinhead. Mm-hmm. We're really looking forward to that because, of course, Clive has now got the rights back in some form. Um, uh, that's publicly known. So, yeah, I'm really hoping he is. The answer I usually give is if Clive asks me, I will do it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of actually playing uh, Chatterer again, I have to point out that I was a lot slimmer in those days. I am back on a diet to get after Christmas and lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not I'd ever actually be able to get, no, I wouldn't. I was a 32 inch waist back in those days. And there's no way I'd be able to fit back if the costume doesn't exist anymore in terms. Of, well, it, no, it does exist. It's in the hands of a private collector, but it is so fragile. <laughs> It doesn't travel anywhere, like the Mars. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's such a rip, rich scene that's done. And I think it's been, you're talking about the franchise, obviously they de- they've done some kind of weird and wonderful things under the Dimension films in terms of taking existing scripts and shoehorning. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, they weren't really strictly in the spirit of the Hellraiser. But of course, we, you know, I wrote comics. I wrote comics for Marvel based in the Hellraiser universe. 
So I'm really hoping that, you know, in future we will have more stuff that goes back to Clive's original vision. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because who doesn't love a little bit of sex, death and starshine, uh, which is kind of what Hellraiser is about. Um, so, yeah, I, I think given the chance, if asked, if Clive asked me, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, and it, it's funny to hear you say that. Um and I'm excited to see what this new female Hell- Hellraiser will look like, but I can't help but think that uh, th- the entire thing would be so much better if we could just kind of go back to, like what you said, go back to some of maybe the more original content. Because I think that uh, Hellraiser and Pinhead and the Cenobites and stuff can re-emerge in modern times as one of those huge IPs and characters again i know they've i mean look like you said they've they've shoehorned you know hellraiser into all these scripts that were already written for other projects and bits and pieces and and they managed to make it something that's that stood the test of time so i'd like to see it now come back full circle um so i would imagine you see that there's a way of doing that and also do you think that we would if we saw them all back together, would it be an aged version? Or would that not make sense? I see a lot of people online talking about that. Like, would we see maybe ah. they've been away for X amount of time and they come back as like a maybe an older, different version of their character? That's a really interesting idea. And now I think particularly with Chashra, there is definitely possibly a storyline there. Because of the th- Cenobites that we see at the end of Hellbound, he's revealed to be a boy, mm-hmm. which implies that he was a boy when he opened the box and went into hell, um, which is something I examined in my short story, Prayers of Desire. So this idea of growing up, or someone who looks like a child at least, growing up in hell. So yeah, I mean, you know, the idea of a, yes, my my age of Cenobite um, is kind of interesting, you know, that, yeah, that's actually, that's a really fascinating idea, isn't it? So if you look at the world of the 1980s, the mid 1980s, so much has changed and actually so little has changed mm. because, I mean, if you look at politically, you've got another really right-wing conservative government in power in this country, which we did in the 1980s. I mean, we had Thatcher, who was, you know, making life really tough for gay people. Um, Really, really tough for gay people. And although we're not the objects of the current government's uh, removal of rights, they're actually cheerfully removing the rights from everybody, not just people who've, who weren't born in this country, but kind of everybody, everybody in terms yep. of protest. So it'd be interesting to see what their view of it, of the world is. And there's obviously something timeless about the idea of Leviathan, who we see in the second film, you know, that huge spinning yeah. diamond thing. So yeah, I think there's a rich mine of things to be, because things are less forbidden now than they were then. I mean, if you, the, when Hellraiser was made, there was no internet. There was no online porn. Yeah, Mag- when you think you know, about you that. You got porn for magazines. You, you know, all these things were very much, the sexuality stuff was very much more forbidden. Now, less so mm-hmm. in terms of, but there are still limits. You know, there are still things, and I think the Cenobites here, yeah. Yeah, cool idea. Could be very exciting. Um, and I feel like as well, the you kind of alluded to it. There's a lot of backstory, lore, different things like that, which the community eats up anyway. And I just think yeah. that it's a it'll be a missed opportunity if all that doesn't get to get explored. And you had yeah. mentioned that you had written, um, you know, comics for Marvel and different things like that. Am I right in saying that that was when you stepped away kind of from from acting and, and movies? Because yeah. yes. a lot of people, I don't think, this is not very uh, 
I don't think widely publicized a lot of people when they found out I was going to be speaking to you. Uh, I I got the, you know, ask why from 1990 was there not really much? Why, you know, you had been chatterer and you had been in these two, you know, huge d- different um, movies. Then you go on and you mm. have you're you're in Nightbreed and. A lot of people would see that as like, well, is that not the pinnacle for like somebody who wants to get into this stuff? Couldn't you have kind of probably went anywhere from there? And it seemed like yes, a, a, I guess, a risky move to say, look, I'm going to step back and pursue <laughs> something else. Yeah, but that's exactly what happened. And in fact, it happened on the red carpet for Nightbreed. So... Uh, Hellraiser didn't have a red carpet. It went straight into um, cinemas. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we didn't, I don't think we even had a cast and crew screening for Hellraiser. So come Nightbreed, I've done three films with Clive and there is something in me that just says, okay. And it was literally on the red carpet because I remember being on the red carpet and there were cameras flashing and people walking up to me and asking me for my autograph and being really excited to meet. And now this is the first time we'd really experienced this. Only the first time I had ever experienced anything like this because we were in London's West End and it was a big thing, Nightbreed. And I just remember being on the red carpet and thinking, I'm not feeling this. I'm not, I'm, 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 in my mind, I was supposed to be so much more excited. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to, you know, this is it. I've done it and, and I'm going to go off and do more. And I kind of realized, you know, that, uh, we say this, but also horror was kind of really looked down upon in those days in terms of professional stuff. Yeah. Horror really was, is not mainstream. Mainstream was Room, room with a View. Mm-hmm. And... I just wasn't getting the auditions and I, re- and I just really didn't want to do it. I, what I really wanted to do was go off and write. And I'd really got bitten by this bug of writing short stories and writing. In fact, when I wrote to my agent, I said something along the lines of, I just want, I've been speaking my, I've been speaking others voices uh, for a while now. Cause I mean, by that stage, it was the best part of 10 years that I'd been acting. And I just like, I'm a, it was also combined with other things. The work I was getting, I wasn't getting paid for, even though I was supposed to be paid. You know, you were waiting three to six months to actually get paid for stuff you were yeah. doing. It was just like soul destroying tough. And I, thought, I want to write. And I got really interested in comics and like being in, you know, had the opportunity to write comics. And I was just like, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to try and make a career of this. Three years later, I discovered, I, you know, all my titles were cancelled and um i was like 12 grand in debt so it's like oh i've got to get a real job Mm. now and that ended up by being computers and that's i did through till 2012 when i was made redundant Uh, and again you know when i was made redundant it's like oh how finally at last i can go back to writing i can go Mm -hmm. back to being an actor this is where i obviously should be this is where i should have been this is what i should have stuck with we we make these choices in our lives um and i'm very lucky that you know people have been asked to be working with me since um so yeah i never regret all the mistakes you've made (laughs) because yeah if you're sensible you learn from them um and if anyone really wants to know about, yeah, kind of if I'd had more courage, if I'd stuck at things more, if I'd done, if I'd worked out how it all worked better in terms of getting work, perhaps I would have had a better career uh, or more successful career. But I didn't. Those were the cho- That was the choice I made back then. And uh, again, like that, to, to kind of backtrack a little bit there. Uh, so it's like, you know, you are doing these stage plays or theater and all these different things you're getting involved in all these projects then it's like bam you're in a clive barker movie as one of i would say now outside of pinhead the the most iconic character um you know then you're then you're in the next movie then you're in nightbreed you have this great role in nightbreed and then it's like bam oh now i'm writing comics and you know i'm working with marvel and i'm like working all these projects 
again, how do <laughs> I guess to to uh, a regular person, it seems quite crazy that you're on a, a red carpet for Nightbreed and you're like, yeah, I think I want to get into that. And then it's just like kind of like, bam, now I'm like working with Marvel and these huge companies. That's like a dream for people. How was that transition or how did that come about? It was tough. I mean, I remember at times thinking, oh God, I can't, what have I done now? I spent a lot of my, my life going, what have I done now? <laughs> <laughs> so I do remember being in my flat and I was terrible at deadlines. I remember I really struggled with deadlines. I got, I, I get, I think my problem is I get bored really easily. I just like, Oh, and it's like, Oh, there's a thing. Oh, what's that? Oh, there's another thing. Oh, that's fascinating. There's another thing. That's fascinating. The, so the transition was tough and there were times when I had to, I remember writing thing there thinking, stop complaining, Nick, just be really grateful because there are people who would kill for the opportunities that you've got. You just, just be really great. And I am, yeah, I'm incredibly mm-hmm. grateful uh, to all that stuff. And I'm really pleased with some of the work that I produced. I remember, um, I'll try and cut this, short, this story short, but basically one of the comics that I wrote for the Hellraiser stuff, I used the line, which I, is mostly pinched from um, the author of Gorm and Gast, we stand in crazy balance. His original line in a poem is, we stand in crazy balance at the edge of time. And I just love this phrase, we stand in crazy balance. And I would put it in the mouth of a priest trying to explain the difference between humanity and the Cenobites. Because in my mind, we're in kind of Christian mythology, mm-hmm. chaos is associated with hell. Humanity is order and the divine order of, uh, of Jehovah or whatever, the mm-hmm. Christian God. Kind of in Hellraiser, it's flipped. Humanity is chaos. The natural state of humanity is desire and chaos. And, and the Cenobites kind of, rep, you know, they're, they're in fact, they're referred to as the Order of the Gash. They look like priests, particularly Pinhead and the female Cenobites or priestesses. And they kind of want to instill order on humanity and flesh in my mind. And I remember writing about this and giving this line to a priest who's trying to explain this to somebody. And that basically the fundamentally humans like certainty. Mm -hmm. We are very bad at uncertainty, which is crazy because in our heart of hearts, we all know nothing is certain. The only certainty is change, as the Buddha said. And Yet we crave certainty. This is why the right wing and fascism is so attractive to people in my mind, because it's like, yeah, they've got all the answers. It's going to be, yeah. So the end, I put this in this comic, this comic was published, and then about a year later, a friend sent me a clipping from another comic called Cerebus the Aardvark and the Letters Page. Uh, Sarah's The Art of Art by Dave Sims, well known for its letters page and the conversations that went on there. And again, this is all pre-internet. And I've got it framed on the wall behind me. This letter just saying, a guy saying, I, I really understood what Nicholas was trying to say here. I am a black policeman in Los Angeles after the Rodney K- and I was there at the Rodney King riots. And every day when I put on my gun, I think of this, that we stand in crazy balance. Um, to, you know, to try and maintain your balance in the chaos that's going around mm-hmm. you is hard, but that's something that we all, ha- I think we have to strive. That's that's the, hu- the personal human journey as far as I'm concerned. So... Yeah, I did give up acting. I gave up on that. But the rewards that I've got for the when, when I'm writing and acting and all these things, I'm incredibly fortunate. I'm incredibly lucky. So I got it horribly wrong in some senses, and I also got it horribly right as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. And so to go from, you know, like you said, you decided to go to writing and then 
things started to not work out as well. So I, mm. I, I guess to go from from doing that and following your passions and, and kind of taking risks and then having to to pivot into, like you said, like get, get a real job. And it's something yeah. that um, I talk about a lot because it can be, I think, for creative people. And you had mentioned like you, mm. you get um, bored easy or whatever. And I feel like that's a sign of like huge pent up creativity. And it's really hard to like try and point your focus right on something you kind of see something else and you go oh i've got an idea about that or i, I want to do this how difficult was it for you then or was it just kind of a natural progression how difficult was it to kind of switch that oh, off and go to tough. like the real world <laughs> the real world um it's tough it, it was really really tough and like my husband said you know when it when they at the other end of the period when I got made redundant and I, he, he just said, Nick, you are so much happier. Yeah. You are so much happier now than when you spent all your day looking at spreadsheets and databases. Um, the irony is of course that I joined um, the green party during lockdown because I thought you know, the other thing my attention got diverted to was what a shit show we're in, in terms of the climate mm-hmm. and what can I do? Okay, I can't change central politics. I'm going to work with the local Green Party to at least let get Green councillors elected. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring all, bring all my talents and skills. And I've ended up by working on spreadsheets again, um, which is fine. You know, it's it's like it's just like I'm staring at data, just looking at data. But at least I now feel the data I'm looking at is really, really important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of we need more green councils, we meet, need more MPs and so on. It was, it was tough. I, I do remember at the time thinking, okay, this is n- maybe not what I want to do, but if someone's employing me, I'm going to bring everything I've got. If I'm going to be a telephone operator, if I'm going to be a telephone receptionist, oh God, I was a telephone receptionist for bailiffs during the poll tax um, for about six months, I remember. It's like, I'm going to do this really well and I'm going to walk, you know, I'm going to bring everything I can think about it to that job. So I think I was a really good employee uh, for for most of the time. It's like really, really bored with things. Um, And once again, but yeah, it's tough. But I think all great, I think trying to find a way of putting a roof over your head getting um, food on the table, supporting a family for many people is tough, but that is the reality of the world. I think we, we think of many of these great artists like Leonardo da Vinci and so on, and you forget they had patrons. Mm-hmm. You know, the Medici family patronized the arts. They just gave money to creatives to just be creative because they realized the value. Okay. They realized the importance of their own stature in terms of the political effects of, you know, Mm -hmm. these big buildings and paintings and, you know, that's the reason they patronized all these wonderful, wonderful artists, but it did mean that artists are created, I mean, you know, writers, creators, painters, sculptors didn't have to worry about where the next meal they just had to worry about pleasing their patron yeah. and delivering stuff that they were happy with never that's i think that's never going to change and that's kind of the thing and you just and we all have to find the way and to find that's that balance and i think it is easy to say, okay, well, I don't do this full-time, therefore I'm not a real photographer, therefore I'm not a real writer, or therefore I'm not a whatever. That's so few people. So f- I think within Equity, the Actors' Union, it's like two people, 2% of the members are f- can say that hand on heart, they only earn their yeah. daily bread from, from, from acting. Yeah. And you know, and the thing is, then you find actors becoming directors and writers and producers and so on, just to get pro- projects going. So you know, the term actor isn't just a person in 
in many cases, not in all cases, and that's nothing against those who aren't interested in these things. But many actors find themselves having to write, produce, direct, mm-hmm. just to get projects happen, you know, make sure projects happen. So, yeah. It's something that fascinates me. And and maybe the way I phrase that there about, you know, having to go to the real world that you weren't <laughs> living in reality beforehand. It's something that I always, I, I always enjoy to pick people's brains on this. Mm. Um, because it's one of those things where I think people... All people want to do is something they're passionate about and something that makes them happy. And then we kind of, um, I suppose in a lot of ways people see it as like, you know, they get caught in the trap and, you know, 40 years passes by and, you know, you're in your 70s and you're kind of going, huh, I've really done any of those things. And it, it always fascinates me. The ba- And it's like what you said, and it kind of ties into the quote about the balance. It's like... Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've got to live. Some people have got kids. Some people have got this. Some people have got that. So I've got to take care of these core things. But I also have this other thing that really makes me feel alive. And it's like, which do I... You know, it, you feel like that if I'm given more to this one, maybe someone's coming away from the other one. And it's like, then if I give more to this one, now personally inside, deep down, I'm not going to be fulfilled. How can I juggle those two yeah no you're absolutely right Aaron and it's it is tough it is tough and I think and and honestly I again it's part of the human condition and Buddhism it's kind of referred to as the world of hunger this constant striving um for something more and it's kind of got two sides to it there's a negative side of you are never satisfied and you always want what the other guy's got yeah and that's and that can re- lead to really, you know, leads to jealousy. It can lead to all sorts of dark behaviors. The flip side of it is that if as a creator, you weren't constantly desiring to do more, you would stop. So as writers, as an artist, oh God, the number of images I have in my head that I was just like, if I can only get time just to get this down on paper yeah. um, or even a tablet or just anything to get it out of my head. I need to get this image out of my head so that I can move on to the next one. Um, I remember talking to Pete Atkins about the fact sometimes you just have to write a story, even though um, it's not necessarily your best work, but you've just got to get it out there. You've got to move through it in order to be able to get on to the next thing. Pete Atkins was the uh, writer of Hellbound. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, another great mate of Clive Barker from from the Liverpool days, and a lovely, lovely guy. Um, so yeah, I think it is just it's tough and it's horrible and it it's frustrating as hell. But that if you and as I say, I'm really proud of the quote that, that I mentioned. That, you know, the coming. I'm, I'm, I find that incredibly touching. I you know find it deeply touching when people say how much they enjoy chatter and what it means to them as well. And the same with Kinsky and Nightbreed. I'm so grateful um, for these things. It's, you know, and and it means I get to talk to you and it means I get to talk to somebody else this afternoon as it happens. I've got two interviews today. And I also means I get to talk on my show to people like Malcolm McDowell and Lynn Shea um, it's it's Tracy Lords and all the other wonderful guests I've had on my show who again are inspiring interesting people so I can't remember what the question was now <laughs> I was just now that you mentioned it, it was something I was going to segue into later on but you mentioned your show um which is uh, for anybody who who is a, a fan of anything I do I don't know why you would be but um if they haven't seen or listened or heard of your show it's something I think that everybody really needs to. It's something actually, uh, and again, I don't mean this as a slight. It's a, it's another one of those projects and and creative art forms, I guess, that it pains me sometimes when I don't see them get the recognition I think they should maybe. Um, a lot of times I see it online, you know, uh, the Europeans are starved for this content and it's always like the Americans and that's not anything against the Americans, but I do feel like Mm, that sometimes mm. at this side of the world, we feel like, you know, why does it always have to be 
um, you know, Fangoria and why does it always have to be Dread Central and all these different things. And it's like, no, no, there there is some really great things over here. I just think that we don't go looking and we don't find these things and then really get behind them. Um, I, mm, and I think maybe, well, I was just going to say, I think maybe that has something to do with uh, a lot of times people see like a, a tag on something. You know, if I've got a, a plain black T-shirt and it has Primark on it, it's like, oh yeah, Primark. But then if I have the same black T-shirt and it has Gucci on it, it's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Good. That's obviously, you know, well, it's Dread Central or it's this or it's that. That kind of pains me sometimes because your show is one of those things that I I always say to people, I'm like, I, how have you not, or it's like, oh yeah, I've seen Bits and Bobs. And I'm like, how do you not follow that? Uh, I guess my question was going to be, what, uh, for you personally, what, what, what inspired you or made you want to, to sit down and have those conversations and kind of, you know, rather than it be like it is right now where I'm picking your brain and we want to hear from you kind of flipping that, I guess it seems unusual for some people that somebody in your position would kind of flip the script a little bit and you get someone else's kind of opinion and. Well, I, okay, so it, like many of these things, well, of course, this, we're talking about the Chattering Hour. Yeah. Um, but I did have a previous show, the ch- um, Chattering with Nicholas Vince, mm-hmm. when I spoke to independent filmmakers. The great thing about the Chattering Hour is, hey, so how did it come about? Okay, it came about because of lockdown. Um, and, you know, the years that we've gone through, like, so many I had a friend of mine talking about um, her husband. She, she was really proud of him. Um, because he developed this passion during lockdown and he was a white middle-aged man and he hadn't created a podcast. (laughs) I thought, yeah, (laughs) awful lot of podcasts started during lockdown. Snap. So, you know, and I was invited, my manager um, and my great friend, Chris Rowe, um, who's the producer of the show, said, Nick, would you be interested in doing this? I'll put it together if you're interested in doing this again. I did think about it and I thought, hell yeah this sounds really interesting what do i get from it i get to talk to malcolm mcdowell i get to talk to lynn shea yeah. um and i get to pick their brains i get to do what you're doing yeah. now my father this is relevant my father passed when he was 97 years old and right up until the very end i always said my dad was one of the youngest people I knew Mm -hmm. because dad was always curious, always interested, always wanting to learn something. And I'm just the same. And I think this is when we talk about youth, we talk about an openness of mind in terms of, oh, wow, I did not know that. That's, That's fascinating. And I can always learn something. I can always find a new insight. Uh, Talking to Chris Sarandon about the dog day afternoon Mm -hmm. and the fact that he was uh, because we were talking about a phone call that happens in the film and i just said you know that's i was so impressed by that sequence because normally you're just talking down to a line and somebody's reading a script he said no no we did it as a live phone call we actually set up a phone call so al pacino was on one end of the line and i was on the other and and they filmed it as a real telephone conversation and he just thought wow that is extraordinary mm-hmm. because it's not, I, that's the first time I'd ever heard of that happening. Um, so you can tell, I get so excited with all my guests because every single one of them will, you know, one of the lessons I learned from Lynn Shay that I so treasure, which is, you know, on a film set, everyone's working to, is working to make it a safe place to tell the truth. And I thought, wow, that's that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. Mm-hmm. And that is an amazing insight into the, what the year, because as an actor, you are all, you know, you're, you're trying to remember your lines in my case, um, but you're striving to tell the truth. You, Whatever the situation is, and if it's well written, that's what you do. It's what we do as a writer. We have to tell our truth, go back to the urge to communicate and that 
truth. I don't know, Aaron, do you write, apart from doing this, what, yeah. what's your creative bent? What do you like to do? I do like to write, actually, funny. And, and I had a, a conversation with somebody yesterday who's penned, another Englishman, actually, who's penned four or five of his own self-published books, mm. uh, you know, uh, revolving around horror movies and things like that. Um, I... If for me, actually, it started off as I used to have these really crazy nightmares and I would always wake up and kind of half scribble things, but then not remember. So then I started to record, uh, like voice record it. I would like wake up and I'd be like, OK, this happened, that happened. And I would forget about it. And it kind of started off as that. And I tried to, um, I, I guess in a lot of ways, then I was trying to force these stories. And I there's a part of me that wishes that I knew how to structure things maybe a little bit better. I found that, um, I guess, if if you were to look at it as, like, a professionally, I'm probably better at sitting down maybe and putting a book together about, you know, this era of movies or this subgenre or this whatever versus right. actually writing my own story. But I'm fascinated by that. That's why I, I was interested to hear yeah. some of your takes on, you know, short stories and the comics and stuff. It fascinates me that somebody can sit down and and build these worlds out from from nothing really, or being given like just a grain, and then it just blossoms into this huge thing. Yeah, and and we never know what's going to bl- blossom. I, you know, I never knew when I wrote that line about crazy balances that it was going to touch somebody so deeply and in yeah. such a remarkable situation. So you know, you do. okay. In terms of structure, that's an interesting one. Because when I was writing comics, uh, the fun challenge I had was these were being written for weekly comics in the UK. Some of the work I did, not the Hellraiser stuff, I think Warheads was being written for a weekly comic in the UK and a monthly comic in America. So it's 22 pages in America, uh, or 24 pages. Yeah, 24. So divide by four, you get six pages. So... You have to have a weekly six-page comic that's definitely got to have a cliffhanger at the end of the sixth page because you want them to come back next week and buy the comic again and look forward to finding out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that taught me a lot about... In fact, I remember when I... When you think when thinking about the American comics, when I was writing Nightbreed, which was a 22-page, 24-page American comic just per se, I created an A4 spread and I drew oblongs that represented a page and I put spaces where I knew there was going to be an advert and I knew which was a left left side and I knew which was a right side so that I knew when you turned over the page what you'd see. Yeah. So you need you make sure that your a big dramatic reveal is on a left page because somebody is going to look at you when you do that. And I remember this it's like okay it was a really good way of learning to write and structure stuff because you think, okay, I I have to hit a beat here. Yeah. I have to hit something exciting here. I've got to do that. I will, you know, when I return to writing and I was faced with exactly the same thing as I've not done it for 20 odd years. I got a book called Into the Woods. It's only a short book. Now, there are lots of books on structure particularly on, f- on sc- screenplay structure. Um, Save the Cat is probably one of the most favorite, uh, famous ones. Um, but basically, in Into the Woods, the author has looked at all these theories in terms of, and all the way back to the good Greek plays and three-act mm-hmm. three act plays and so on. There's a very definite structure to, to those. And he's summarized it all. And he was, you know, and then pointing out that probably five act structure is slightly more interesting. Um, once you have a read of that book, and it is literally that thin, it's not thick at all. It's like a hundred pages or something like that, but absolutely fascinating. And then you just think, okay, here's this. All you, I used to is just you just kind of make notes, and you just. All I do is like a blank piece of paper. I'm going to fill this blank piece of paper. Remember when I was writing comics? So to produce a 
script. So we're using the Marvel method here. So generally speaking, you're talking about a page to a page and it describes the six frames on the page mm-hmm. and the dialogue and the actions. To produce, what is it, 22 pages, I probably wrote another 100 or so just with notes and rejected ideas and that is the kind of manure the soil for your you know for that flower that thing i think you know people it's it's it is the iceberg the thing you see is all based on an awful lot of stuff you made a comment about earlier on about your show and immediately you put did that kind of british irish thing of I'm not sure why anyone would want to do anything I do. <laughs> yeah. God, it's built into all of us, isn't it? And you don't find it so much in America. No, no, you don't. <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> Exude so, so, confidence. It's just like, yeah, this is me. Like, uh, this is me. Yep. And, and I, I think, you know, it's something I've learned, it was, I love learning from Americans, just saying, yeah, okay. Because you're actually saying, I'm responsible for this. If you don't like it, we can have a dialogue. Or... If you don't happen to like it, pass me by. Um, Mm -hmm. Because somebody else will. But the important thing is it's my truth. It always comes back. Everything, every art that resonates, whether it be standing in crazy balance, there's a truth there. Um, Another one of my favorite truths I wrote was... um, when we celebrate peace and do not fear it, sorry, when we celebrate difference and do not fear it, we create peace. You know, the, I talked about right-wing fascism is about an order and people are saying, you have to be like this. You have to be like this because it makes me happy, is what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Whereas I've kind of grown up with parents who served in the Second World War who, whose parents, my grandparents, lived through the First World War. And that had a profound effect on my grandparents in terms of religion and, and rejecting religion. Um, my parents were very open. And they produced three boys who were, you know, me and my brothers, we have very open ideas, very left-wing ideas, because it was just saying, unless you're threatening and hurting somebody else, it's no, it doesn't make me afraid. Fascism to me is a pure product of fear. So when I think, it, you know, it, it does come down to the, having the courage to speak your truth and going, oh God, and it's terrifying, you know, showing stuff to, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really lucky. I, I, the people I show my stuff to are really, supportive mm-hmm. um editors will come back to me and just say yeah now that's not working <laughs> your punctuation is bad and it's like yeah i know i kind of punctuate it the way i speak mm-hmm. um it's great when i'm writing dialogue because i can write really good it really sounds like people speaking yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Doing yeah. The bits in between <laughs> i really have to think where does the comma go <laughs> And it's all, you just have to kind of learn that and 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 in learning to enjoy your failures learning to work through those things learning to think, right, just you see nothing is ever a waste of time as far as i'm concerned a failure as long as you learn from it and more importantly if it if you can remember it and therefore teach others mm-hmm. so that you can avoid those pitfalls then I think they're, they're wonderful things. You know, I fail in order that you might, you might succeed, which is great. You know, that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. It, it was something. Um, so you get, I have all these conversations. I want, I, want, I want to go, the moment I finish this conversation, I must get back to doing some writing. I must open up my scrivener and do some writing again because I get so excited. Yeah, and uh, it's definitely infectious as well because I'm feeling that from you. And it was something before you had mentioned your dad and about how curious and how... Uh, you yeah, and it's it's so funny because when you said uh, you know he he was like the the youngest person that I knew, and it, it's uh, and uh, not a word of a lie. It's funny uh, as you said that I was literally thinking the exact same thing about you, in the sense of it's like 
is it is it the youngest older person or the older younger person or I don't you have this um this energy or this passion about you that's kind of um I don't know how to explain it. you you seem very alive and I know that sounds ridiculous to say in you know like a <laughs> a basic term but like you know I think we meet so many people every day all these countless people and, and we're just kind of there and there's no real life if you get me um and you have that about you is that something that you've always had or um I guess is it something that you have to work on to try and block out especially like the last couple of years we've had with lockdowns and all the stuff that's come after that now uh how do you deal with I guess negativity and naysayers and I'm sure you've dealt with lots of stuff like that you know where people are like you can't be a writer and you can't be an actor and what are you doing that for you should just get a job in Tesco's and just yeah, shut up and just do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, why didn't you grow up? <laughs> there was the famous occasion when I was in my early ten to twenties with the family and saying, I'm "Not sure what I'm going to be when I grow up." And my brother just looked at me, <laughs> "Nick, you're twenty three years old." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I'm still trying to work out what I'm going to be when yeah. I grow up." It, I can be honest with you. Um, I had to have therapy last year around about this time last year, um, I had six weeks therapy because I was suicidal. I was in a really, really dark state. And I think for many creators, particularly those, and Clive's alluded to this in the past, you know, for many of us who work in the horror industry um, and the horror family, The light, the darkness that we explore is, you know, Clive, people are always surprised at just how lovely a man that Clive is. Um, It's two, but not two. It's different sides of the same coin. One side is dark and one is light. If you, Mm -hmm. if you think about it, you know, whenever, whenever, majority of the time when you, if you, if you, particularly if you hold a coin in your hand, it's two, but not two. It's the same. It's two sides of the same coin. So yes, I have to work. It comes naturally. It comes from other people a lot of the time. So for example, having this conversation is is, uh, waking me up Mm -hmm. without it. You know, I do need other people. Um, I find other people really mysterious and strange. I have to say I do. And I, constantly having to overcome it sounds so ridiculous it's true though i swear terrible shyness um terrible uncertainty uh, literally oh my god what have i said now who have i upset now mm-hmm. i didn't mean oh how how you know i have to really think about how i phrase things at times and it's like i have to control my temper um i can get really really ratty if i and my darling wonderful husband sometimes has, has to has to deal with the fact that i'm just not to be spoken to um because be, the phrase bear with sore head i think is one is like, and that's why i love human beings actually i think it's because i can be like this and it's because of this conversation because you've inspired me you know, our, our dialogue kind of gives me permission mm-hmm there's another lovely Buddhist quote. I mean, you know, when we light, I'm misquoting, but basically when we light a lamp to show the way for another, we are also lighting for our own way. When we help somebody else, and often that is to see things in a different way together. You know, when I, when I spoke about being in, uh, it was talking therapy, it was cognitive behavior therapy um all done over the phone i have a lot of experience with that i don't know for two years oh wow recently and i actually just before i forget i really appreciate you being honest about that because it's something as well i think that that uh it doesn't get talked about enough and it's fascinating i think a lot of times people see these online personas or whatever it might be obviously Mm. we always put our for the most part you're going to put your best face on the internet or whatever um 
and it's refreshing to hear somebody who, like I said, you uh, you don't give off a vibe of shyness or introvertedness or, or anything, you know, like that you, I guess, um, let yourself get dragged down. You have a very mm. infectious kind of happiness. Alive is how, the best way I can explain it is you just seem like you're alive. <laughs> so I really appreciate you saying it like it is. And I think it's important for a lot of people because even I, with, with the following I have, which is not, you know, it's a, say a couple well, of thousand people. Well. You've done, you're doing better than me, and I, you've got a big following. I was checking, and you've done quite a lot of shows. Yeah, and and like I wouldn't consider it a huge following, but I have had an absurd amount of people, and it's quite sad in a way, I guess, reach out to me with things like that about, um, you know, could you tell X person that uh, they helped me through a really hard time, I was suicidal, or I had somebody else say that they lost uh, a long-term girlfriend, in a car accident and and things like that and it sort of blows my mind and I'm like ah this is why I wanted to have these conversations if somebody gets an hour and a half of just relief from whatever or you know they get to tell somebody you know the, the, your movies or your work inspires me to kind of be alive yeah and I, and as I, this is why I talk about being incredibly grateful when people that you know those moments are huge treasures for a, you know for a life um of course immediately okay that's bright happy nick and immediately dark nick says yeah but can you do it again when did you last do that that was years yeah. that was decades ago what have you done since what have you oh, well okay well the the quote about celebrating difference i i made it to a t-shirt and i've had i know at least two men is like yeah i get that and i'm gonna i'm gonna wear your t-shirt because i think it's and one in fact who said he'd seen the quote and then realized he was a buddhist mate of mine from a decade or so when i was happily involved in buddhism buddhism um more than that now um so I, I remember talking to we go let's go back to writing again for a moment because I mm-hmm. think it helps illuminate what we're talking about. I remember talking to my editor say about the characters writing strong so yeah I, mean, I just write what the voices tell me and she said I don't think that's a good line to use in interviews I was like well, why not that's exactly what it's doing <laughs> when I'm writing writing fiction. I get upset if I think somebody's going to die. <laughs> it's like, it's really, I really shouldn't probably be writing horror. Um, <laughs> you know, my characters are very alive to me. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily, they may be inspired by a characteristic of somebody. And I think, oh, that or a line somebody said. Or and that mostly it's going to be something I've gone through or I've experienced or something yeah. I've been close to and all you know, that, that's really made me think about something that's coming from some part of me. These characters kind of are the voices in you become not voices in your head where the, you know, the people who really suffer from voices and tell, you know, literally hear the, just yeah. hear the voices all the time telling them to do something. Um, I'm not talking about that, but these are very clear voices that we hear in our imaginations. Um, I guess that's the difference because between a, a psychosis and the creator, mm-hmm. fine line, yeah. um, is that we know it's our imagination. And some people sadly don't and really suffer because of it, which is, is really sad. But I think, yeah, I think, I'm, I'm glad. well, thank you. Thank you for all the lovely things you're saying to because yes, it's having a platform in which we are able to talk about the human condition. And I think coming back to your writing, coming back to my, and all creation, nobody sees the world like you do. And nobody sees the world like I do. I remember when I was at drama school, we did a, an exercise where, and there are about, 20 of us in the class. So we were put into two, into pairs with with 10 girls, 10 boys, young men, young women. Um, And we were given the same three pages of a script. As a Neil Simon play, I think. Anyway, it was a comedy. And I remember, and we were 
Send away for a week. Okay, go away, rehearse, work on this scene, come back, show the class. It was 10 different plays. Yeah, yeah. It was exactly the same words, but each actor found a different truth in those words because it was their own truth, and that's all we, we can do. You know, there's a lovely, again, one of the inspirational... I come from the era, it's lucky the way we used to have Athena, a shop specializing in posters and particularly inspirational quotes. And there was mm-hmm. a there was a poem called Desiderata. Uh, Go quietly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. And one of the lines is, you know, speak your truth quietly and clearly. I'm probably misquoting. But I think that's all we can do as creators, and that is vital. And it takes courage because you are going to be misunderstood. That's, I, I think that's the... I'm saying to Clive once, I'm completely convinced that all human communication is based on fear and misunderstanding. Um, it's really hard to communicate your ideas and very easy to fall into the trap sometimes of thinking, if I speak my truth, people will be persuaded. Yeah. And because they're persuaded, I'm therefore validated, therefore my truth is truth. That's not true. (laughs) How many words? I was going to use the word true. That's not my experience. And I think it's one of the things I've learned over the years is that I cannot change anybody. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who I would love to change because I think they'd be a damn sight happier if they just listened to me and understood what it is, understood the truth I'm telling. But the the thing is, people don't work like that. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, you know, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. Um, We can only change ourselves. We can, and we are all growing and we're all striving because none of us have got there. Off. The Buddha got there, definitely. Nelson Mandela got there, Desmond Tutu got there. But even then, you know, they were human beings. Um, they had their failings, I'm sure, um, and did things that they would, re- as I do again, going back to the beginning of the conversation, regret. As long as you. A lot of the time we have to learn to forgive ourselves yeah. first before we forgive others. I, I think I am just rambling now. <laughs> it, it's something, though, that... Uh, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on, on, on this as well. Obviously, you know, it's, you know, we're talking about movies and film and art and creation and stuff, but a lot of times this stuff ties into it, and I don't know whether it's just the world we live in now where maybe there's a lot of people out there who struggle with things like that and they they kind of want to talk about it but it and it kind of alludes to something you said before about uh, i think a lot of people feel like they have to be given permission so it's mm. like you know mm. somebody may look up to you and your work and what you've done and now all of a sudden when you've maybe spoke about your struggles or you know how you might view something all of a sudden now uh, i feel like i have permission to go yeah you know what i i actually do struggle or it's not as easy or it's not as happy and great as I might say on Instagram or when I go outside the door, I, I do actually, you know, suffer with these thoughts or issues or whatever. You remind me of, um, gosh, I'm quoting an awful lot. T.S. Eliot wrote a play called The Cocktail Party. Mm-hmm. And we did it at school and it's supposedly a comedy. Alec Guinness is one of his major theatre roles um, and I, we did it when I was about 16, 17 and obviously had not a clue about what it was It was t- I, it's the only performance I've ever done at school where I, lit, I actually got through it watching people walk out of the auditorium because it was just not working and it was a struggle and again a huge thing to learn but, but there's a line in the play where a psychiatrist, someone who's revealed to be a psychiatrist says, our knowledge of other people is based on the moments during which we have known them. And they have changed since then. 
is it, I think it was alluding to what you're talking to and the fact that basically it's the edited life mm-hmm. you see on Instagram. <laughs> it's the best bits, the bits you want you share. Um, because so I was suddenly struck by something when going through it at the moment because, and we all get lost for words. We all sometimes don't speak because we think, I don't know how to deal with your grief. And I, and because of that, I'm not going to say something in case I say something wrong. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm talking about is I'm not, neighbor lost her son at the beginning of January and he was 26 years old. Wow. And we are, there's, we are still going through it at the moment. She is definitely still going through it at the moment. And it, you know, you come to write the card is one of the things you can do. And you just think, I'm not sure what to say. I don't know what to say. All I can think of is all the cliches I've seen written in the past. And that's okay. Honestly, from having lost two parents and read the cards that I, we received. Very few people are going to be able to say, Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm, deepest condolences and you know let me know if there's anything i can do um to help because that's actually all you can say in those you know there you're not going to come up with you are unlikely sorry i should never say never you're unlikely to come up with that magic pearl of wisdom that will but actually you are more likely to if you stop thinking about how does this make me look and more about how can I help? Yeah. I, I, you know, I think this is one of the things that we all struggle with. It's like, and I think if you, you know, you get to a certain age and you're, and as you say, I'm very lucky and people listen to me and, and do talk to me and tell me how much I inspire. And that feels like a great responsibility that can sometimes feel like a burden. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you, you have to think about what was I trying to say yeah that basically I'll come back to what I said earlier on you have to be forgiving of yourself um you have to accept you're human and you have to accept that being human is about striving to be better and that kind of you never are going to get there you part of actually being there is knowing that you've still got more to learn yeah that each person is different the you know the conversation i'm having with you aaron is something that i will never have with anybody else again i may tell the same stories i may have kind of the same thoughts and i may repeat lines but it's never going to be the same can never be the same yeah as the one because we're all going to draw different things out of, you know, there'd be certain themes. I will repeat lines that I like, that I think are important. But how you deal with that or how your audience deal, you know, the individual members of your audience deal with those things completely beyond our control. Yeah. Completely yeah. beyond our, our control. I, you know, it is like sowing seeds. You seem, um, you don't see my, I, I can already know before I make this statement that you're uh, extremely well read and on on a lot of different topics. Is that mm. something, had you always been like that? You know, you've mentioned um, a lot of different poems, uh, you've mentioned mm. Buddha and different things like that. Is that something that you actively seek out? Like, do you look for different viewpoints and ideas is it books you read? Is it, uh, you know, podcasts? Is it what? What is it that kind of uh, you use to kind of draw all these different? It, it, it is. I, it is something that I think I started reading late from memory. 
there, but then it was just like, wow, mm-hmm. wow, this is amazing. This yeah. is, I remember picking um, something else that we haven't mentioned. I, you know, before a lockdown, I, was work, I worked on a one man short show called I Am Monsters, yeah. which is all about my life and Hellraiser and Nightbreed and meeting Clive and working with Clive. Now, during the research for that, I remembered and then discovered the book that probably the first book, possibly one of the first books that I got out of the, the junior library, which was a book on the Greek myths and legends. Actually, no, it's not about Greek. It's about world myths and legends. I, I Ridiculous. Always had a book in my hand. Always. These days, less so. Mm-hmm. And I... It sounds really strange. I mean, obviously, I read Clive Barker um, and re-read Clive Barker. The um, other person I constantly read because, honestly, the time I get to read is when I'm trying to get to sleep at night and it's a way of turning my, my brain off, and that's Terry Pratchett. I haven't read all of them. I think I'm missing about two or three. But it's the Discworld novels and Sam Vimes. I'm re- rereading probably for about the sixth or seventh time Small Gods. And honestly, the reason I do it is because I know I can fall asleep. I'm not going to come across anything that's going to keep me awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to turn my brain off mm-hmm. at this stage. So, yeah, I think I do listen to podcasts. Um I'm listening to podcasts on uh, uh, the remarkable cases of Rutherford and Fry on BBC, which is which is a science podcast. Um, I like science and engineering. Mm-hmm. I'm really I, I you know I watch a lot of that stuff. Um, I think I do tend to break the algorithm on YouTube because <laughs> because like it's lino cuts. It's currently a, um, how to hit centri- how to do um, your uh, it's Graham Norton show. It is uh, solar radiant panels, house heating because we're looking at redoing the house at the moment. Um, it's all random stuff, yeah. Uh, because you know, because it's just oh, that's an interesting thing. I wonder what. Yeah, yeah I always find that about uh, about creative people um, and. And I would put myself even in that uh, that bracket as well, where like sometimes I'll have suggestions on YouTube, and I'm like, wait a second, you know, I I I've in the last couple of years gone down this huge like true crime, just fascinated by some of these mm. onslaught stories and just all the little things, and then I could go from that to it could be anything, uh, painting, uh, random DIY things around the house. I found myself at one point just looking for things to be able to do around the house so I could like deep dive into how to do it. Yeah. And I was like, I, I don't even, and then I could go from that to, like you said, it could be Clive Barker. It could be your show. Then it could go from that to something completely the history of Egypt. And yeah, I always find that, that creative people seem to be fascinated by, um, I can't remember who it was recently that I spoke with that, that, uh, that kind of said, uh, you know, I said like, what, you know, what keeps you going? What keeps you alive? It's just a curiosity. That's, it's just curiosity. And that's, that's what, it's not any one thing necessarily. It's just my curiosity. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I think true for probably everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I, say, and I think in history as well, you know, I do like history programs, mm-hmm. not a lot of the history channel is just like, tosh um and and the way it's put together it's like oh god you're really not telling me something and you're just repeating the same thing you're yeah. trying to make it click baity and it's just like okay this is annoying um i it's it's funny i really am screamish i mean the uh, anyone who's watched my shows knows this i am terribly screamish i do have to watch horror films with the lights on in the daylight <laughs> preferably in my finger on the because i get so involved I give you know I I remember watching a trailer 
for a film in a cinema and the car skidded in in desert and threw up a whole load of dust on screen and I immediately sneezed because of the, I was the dust but yeah you know, yeah yeah on yeah. the screen that's you know that's I am hardwired so I do I mean you know there are there are podcasts I would really like to there is um Ronson the man who wrote the book on uh, psychopaths being bis- uh, really good in business um he's got a series on BBC at the moment about things it's called it's called things fall apart might even remember the name of the poem that that, that comes from um but he talking about the rise of the right and how we got you know mm-hmm. how right-wing views came to be so prevalent and hold so much power it's fascinating i, I listened to one but at the end of the you know the, my problem is i will get five minutes in and get so angry and so upset and so frustrated i can't listen to it anymore because i just think oh no i can't yeah you know it, it, i have the guardian app on my on my ipad and i look at it in the morning just to find out what's going on and I know, half the time it's like i can't look at this because it's I can't control this. It's going to really annoy me. And, you know, the, the whole party gate thing when they're trying to actually, there's the policing and immigration bill and they are, this government is shoving so many things through to control this, to keep themselves in power. Yeah. yeah. By excluding anybody who disagrees with them and might vote them out of office. You know, it's just... Which is the same why I eventually ended up year and a half, September 2020, um, joining the Green Party. I've got to do something. Yeah, I, I, I love that about your your outlook. And I actually had to, a couple of months into all this COVID lockdown thing, I had to just delete any news apps and stuff from my phone because I felt myself being like drawn into it. And it was like... A lot of the stuff I couldn't, you know, on a on a larger scale, um, change the outcome of or what was happening. But I found it was making me extremely miserable, and I became obsessed with uh, following these things like all day, every day. And everybody I would like come across, I would like be like, "Did you hear X, Y, and Z?" And then I would go on like a forty five minute rant about why it's wrong and why you know. How come? Why? The way this and why that? And I was like, I need to take a step back here and try and, and I and I love that that you said you kind of, I guess zoned in on okay, what what can I do for some of these things that I can actually actively affect, you know? I think it's one thing to be able to sit around and just kind of, oh, you know, this is ridiculous and I can't believe this and we need to change that and then not actually trying to do anything. Yes, I, I think we and we talk about it. Funny enough, we're talking about it in the Green Party the other day, saying it's like outrage isn't isn't necessarily constructive unless mm-hmm. you know it's easy to be outraged on social media um and whip it up and it's like it's, it's, random. Yeah. it's like okay i'm not interested in any of that i agree what are we going to do about it what's what's the next step forward i don't you know i talk it's very easy as human beings uh, talk about standing in crazy balance. They also talk sometimes about standing on living your life, standing on one foot. By what I'm and what I mean by that is, you get yourself into a situation is like I don't know what to do now, and I'm so scared of making the wrong decision. I won't make any decision. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas actually, what you have to do is get it wrong. Yeah. Just put your foot down. Oh. Okay, that feels better because I'm now moving somewhere. Uh, what? What? If, no, that's wrong. Okay, well, I'll put my foot down again and I'll go in a different direction. And that's kind of how things work in life. It's just like, okay, well, I'll explore that possibility. Did it work? No, it didn't. Okay, I need to maybe go back a couple of steps. My yeah. husband is a wonderful knitter. I'm not wearing one of his hats at the moment. I normally have one. If, if it was colder, I'd be wearing one of his knitted hats. And it, I, I love what he said to me this morning. He said, I've got a section wrong. I'm going to have to undo it all. 
And he's talking about an evening or a couple of evenings mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. We call him about ribbit. You rip it back. Yeah. Frogging. It's referred to as frogging, <laughs> where you have to go back and do it again. Um, and he just thinks, oh, yeah. And, but he accepts that as that is all part of the creative process. To get there, you're going to make strong mistakes. And I think it's what we're talk- you were talking about. It reminds me of another comedy program I heard the other day. I do like BBC Radio 4 Extra, where they show, mm-hmm. they play old things from my childhood. But also the, there's a lovely um, a comedian, I can't remember the lady's name, we're talking about, you know, is it, Basically, she's against, and what she is against is 24-hour news. And she reminded me that when I was a kid, when I grew up, before the internet, Mm -hmm. you had news, actually, when I first grew up, you had news at 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock on BBC. And that was it, because there was no daytime television. So to get news you either had to get the newspaper delivered to your door and my parents read that i didn't have any interest in reading but whatever it was they were getting um i think it may have been the telegraph i can't remember occasionally i would look for the cartoons on the back page yeah. um, that was my interest in those in those things i was far more interested in fiction um and particularly science fiction and horror and so on that was a great way to live because you didn't you could just say okay how is it okay there's nothing much i can do oh there's interesting or i forgot the local newspaper oh there's a fair going on or there's a fate happening in the center of town yeah we'll go along you take the kids to that oh they're they're talking about this new guy that, that garden is open we'll take the we'll do a family way out oh there's something going on there's a whatever mm-hmm. the carnival's coming to town kind of local interesting news which you could do something about and enjoy the rest of the day you just got on with your work or reading all that you know now we get messages people want responses to things within and it's just like i hardly go on facebook these days i know yeah i will very seldom post i can't remember the last i think i did share something this morning because oh it was polar bears <laughs> Last thing I shared to Facebook, um, I found this fascinating set of photographs of polar bears in an abandoned Russian weather station. It's great because you've got polar bears, real life polar bears, sitting mm-hmm. on a porch <laughs> and running towards the camera. And then you discover that actually the um, photographer wasn't there. These are all drone shots. So he's got this little drone Sean, with a camera the on it and of course he can get much closer to a bear than uh but it's like wow these are so cool and it's like the last that's the lot you know apart from the messaging and uh, checking messages and looking at friend requests i'd never look at the timeline yeah. on facebook because it's just like okay too much just yeah. too much yeah. um and you know now i'm uh, got my writing i've got my art and i've got my greenpeace stuff uh and the house and i'm actually seeing my husband every so often and going off and oh the dog yeah the dog walking the dog and, and so on it's just like yeah this is enough this is probably still a good way to live these days and it's um i do think a lot of good things have come from social media and i was just about to hmm. to cut in there and say probably the worst thing that i have is a phone i wish that they weren't invented in a lot of ways the modern day phone um yeah i think maybe we've lost touch of that like simple things you know um just taking a walk with a loved one uh, having uh, maybe a cup of tea and just a conversation that doesn't involve an ipad or a television or a radio or anything um and i definitely i i've deleted facebook from my phone everything i just found myself on it but not really interested in anything and not really knowing why and i was fascinated in the last maybe two three years to find out like i didn't realize with these social media companies how many uh you know they hire like psychologists and and all these different people to examine the human condition and you know what kind of things we need to be pushing to have people like it's essentially like a drug in a lot of ways uh, sorry to interrupt, you just reminded me of the documentary which came out around about Christmas, which literally showed you how the algorithm worked 
and demonstrated it by showing a man who just happened to be on Facebook and ends up by being arrested at a right-wing demonstration. Because the algorithm constantly feeds on rants, uh, outrage, um, because that's what attracts the most views and therefore keeps you on the platform longer. Mm -hmm. And we know that these companies literally are programming. It's not too harsh a word. You know, they're programming people to be, to QA, QA and non. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, it's the prime example of because the other part of the human, being human is that I just got learned recently in the last year or so is that we love to think that we've discovered something new mm-hmm. and that we've discovered the secret. We've discovered something that nobody else knows. And then to find like-minded people. And I think, you know, that's um, what people, you know, that is part of it. And that's what people do. And it's, it's, I remember doing this at school over a project. It's like, oh, I found this thing. Oh, this, oh, yeah, this, I think I found this truth. Because you kind of blink it and you're like, okay, and the moment you think, oh, this is wild, yeah, this is, and because of that, then, yeah, that that all makes sense. That must be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those Hollywood people, yeah, they, they're, they're only successful because they're eating babies? Uh, yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Did not at one point you think, this might be a bit crazy? Well, no, because you're constantly being told that you, in the past, you know, the American dream, um, no one in America is poor. They're all financially embarrassed, as somebody pointed out, because they all believe that they should, you know, they have a chance to be president. Well, if you're white and middle class. Um, and therefore, if you haven't, it's if you're not president, you're kind of your fault, or yeah. well, it can't be my fault. That's ridiculous. Oh, it's their fault. It's their fault. I'm not president, and that's how you get. And I know you know. And don't get me wrong. I think both sides of the um, uh, the Atlantic and throughout the world. As I describe myself as a liberal, I you know, if it makes you happy, you're not harming anyone fine in fact more than fine i want to know oh that's exciting i I think it's about when i wrote the line about celebrating difference it's not about tolerating difference or accepting difference it's about celebrating difference because then something can grow and then it's exciting but if you're going saying oh yeah it's fine yeah, I'll just look away. I'll just that's not yeah. engaging. That's not being part of the world. So yeah, it, it's something I definitely think we need more of in the world is uh, the celebration of of mm. um, differences and different things like that. Uh, something just popped into my mind, and I don't mm. know, I, I don't know what it was exactly that made me think of it. Um, I, before I forget, because I'm one of those people, I just go off on a tangent about something completely different. How does it feel to have your own Funko Pop figure? <laughs> it was something I actually have. I have it, uh, and I've had it since it first came out. I worked um, in uh, GameStop for over right. a decade, and I was all I got really close with the the head of Funko Europe. He actually lives a town away from me, and um, he brought me they weren't released I don't think at the time or were just about to be released mm. and he yeah. brought me he knew I was a horror guy and he brought me a Chatterer uh, Funko okay. in like a hard plastic case so it wouldn't get damaged how does that like that's got to be crazy for you to <laughs> obviously I know you have action figures and stuff already that sure. have been out for years but I feel like something like Funko now has become like this like iconic mm. 
Like if 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 you're somebody or any you know anybody at a certain level, you're going to be immortalized with a Funko Pop. <laughs> you haven't you haven't arrived until you've become a Funko Pop. What a strange way of de- yeah. measuring people. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you how over the moon I was, um, and I just yeah yeah I've signed so many of those things. Um, I, I was just overjoyed because I mean, as you say I'd already had action figures the chatter I even had an 18 inch animatronic chatter mm-hmm. that chattered its teeth done by NECA they are I, I'm always amazed by these things and always delighted by them because if you go back to the NECA, because my God, the detail they managed to get into these mm-hmm. little six inch uh, characters is absolutely phenomenal. And you just think, oh my God, you know, the person who had to, but I, they were really hope they were paid a decent wage because these, these are extraordinary. Um, and uh, yeah, the Funko Pop, I <laughs> remember what it's like, wow, wow. Yeah, so grateful to Funko, but I then had to go out and watch documentaries on Funko uh, and learn all about them and the, their whole fascinating history of how their company came to be. And, you know, it's just, it's just extraordinary. And again, the community of people who, mm-hmm. with a shared passion uh, for the, for these plastic figures. I um, have to admit, half my, there is a little voice at the back of my mind saying, yeah, that plastic is going to be around for many of the centuries to come. I hope they're dealt with properly when they're eventually, you know, end of life recycle. But I, I kind of think, okay, they're going to be valued. And when, they all um, seem to be, and because you know they're kind of rare as well. So I do hope that they will they don't, they won't end up causing problems in the ocean. They will just end up. But yeah, I'm absolutely delighted by them. How did you? How did you find out about that? Was that something you knew beforehand or was it like no, you like walk somebody, in somewhere and it's like, wait, wait what? Well, I, I think it was a Facebook message, you know, having slammed Facebook. I think it was a Facebook message or probably a, possibly a Twitter message. Uh, people seem to approach me through that. Um, and, oh my God, I've just realized I should really look at Instagram because I, people would message me through that and then I don't look at it for about four or five weeks at a time and think, oh, there's a message. Let's do something about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think somebody just messaged me and I'm going, oh, wow, very, very cool. Because I think people, possibly somebody, I think it was actually Simon, I think it was Butterball, somebody, because people wear the company doesn't create Funko Pops, people will sculpt them out their own, mm-hmm. and somebody had done Butterball, uh, Cenobite, and then, some, and then suddenly said, Nick, it's it's happening, as you heard. Yeah, it's it's one of those things, and I, I wouldn't say I'm a Funko collector, but I do have, uh, you know, if I see unique, if I see unique ones, I'll pick them up. Mm. Um, you know, like the Killer Clowns ones that have come out, uh, there's a couple of unique Buffy the Vampire Slayer ones. Um, and I feel like Chatter is probably... Y- you might have actually got the best uh, looking sculpt of a horror Funko Pop. Because it's the most unique looking, I think. Uh, and the most... Uh, obviously, they're not overly detailed. But your one seems to have been... There was quite a lot of love put into it. Well, that, you've just t- literally taken the words out of my mouth, and I, I think it is the love that really amazes me, um, and 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 I, and I appreciate. Do you have yeah. um, comfort horror movies? I know you said you're quite squeamish and stuff. Is there any movies that you find yourself over the years, maybe, you know, you stick on in the background if if maybe you're writing or if you're doing housework or you know whatever is there some is there any movies that you find yourself revisiting well funnily enough because because you you know i i'm squeamish my husband really doesn't like horror films so i i have to be very careful where i'm watching so i don't put stuff on in the background what do put on in the background when writing when particularly when writing hellraiser stuff was the um album the music Mm -hmm. by christopher young you know that takes me right there 
that it's you know I will occasionally listen if I'm if I am writing it will take me right into that world um I didn't need to do any writing exercises I know exactly where I am and the part of my brain that responds to the Hellraiser stuff is so closely linked to that why horror um what does it mean to you I, I mentioned sex, death, and starshine originally. I think what horror does, it deals with our greatest fears. And if it's intelligent and done well, it can be really illuminating uh, as to the human condition. Mm-hmm. I, my favorite horror film is The Mask of the Red Death. Um, Vincent Price, yeah. Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe. That series of films are probably my favourites, apart from Hellraiser and Nightbreed, obviously. Um, Because it talks, oddly enough, it's about a plague, and it's about a Prince Prospero who, you know, locks up the castle and gets all his mates and says, you know, nobody, you you can do whatever you like in my castle, you can't wear the colour red. Um... But there's lots of talk about, you know, moral decisions to be made and Mm -hmm. what do we do in this case and how, you know, what do you do about if you're infected or if your loved one is infected but you're not, how do you deal with a plague? And it's like, oh, that happens to be very pertinent to what it is. So horror deals with our deepest fears it's about people in extremis therefore it's about you know it's part of the attraction it's yeah. fun to be frightened it's the roller coaster ride part of it as well I do enjoy that when i go kind of, you know when i do allow myself just think, oh this is good i actually feel much clearer you know yeah yeah you feel more relaxed once you've had a really damn good scare yeah um <clears throat> it's because, it's, you know, as long as I watch to the end of the film, I'm absolutely okay. It's when I don't watch the end of the film, I, then I start dreaming, and then that gets really unpleasant as far as I'm concerned. But then I write short stories based on my nightmares anyway. You know, you make what you can out of your nightmares. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, make what you can out of your nightmares, I guess. It's been an absolute pleasure, and there, there's so much that I, I hopefully we'll get to do this again at some point this year. Uh, there's so much we haven't touched on. Sure. Um, we have a mutual friend as well, another Irishman, um, Paddy Murphy. Ah, uh, um, the divine Paddy Murphy. And there's so much other stuff I wanted to get into that um, I, I'm I'm kind of uh, annoyed that I didn't maybe swap the questions no, around it you know, your problem was not that you didn't get to the questions is i just give ridiculously long answers to questions that's what people you love. know wind me up and watch me go this is not your <laughs> yeah. problem and yes i'd love to come back on the show because it'd be and if it weren't for the fact i'd have to go and have lunch <laughs> fantastic that's perfect um, before before i take the dog out because he gets upset if he's you know not done at a particular time <laughs> there is um because you've you've done a lot in the last couple of years and it's mm. some of the stuff maybe we'll touch on the next time but where can people uh where's the best place for people to follow you kind of see what you're up to and some of the stuff you've done recently um okay go to the website nicholasvince.com yep um that's where you can find the shop and you'll mm-hmm. find you know, if, if there is anything, there isn't anything particularly at the moment because mm-hmm. of kind of lockdown. Yeah. Um, and all the stuff, you know, I am actually working on, as I say, some long term projects, which I'm, will definitely be one of which will definitely be announced, I'm guessing April, because uh, it's happening in May, if all goes according to plan. This, these are the plans at the moment. Uh, so when we announce, I'm thinking it's going to be in April. There is stuff happening. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm, and I hope my fans will be fans. The people who, the enthusiasts, as, as Clive um, names people, uh, re- refers to fans, uh, will be happy and excited about um, personal project. So, yeah, nicholasvince.com is a good place to start. Uh, and then, because that's where I'll put major announcements yeah. and put major updates. Um, 
as I say, not terribly good at social media. Mm -hmm. If you could follow me on Twitter, you'll find me retweeting an awful lot of Green Party stuff (laughs) because that's where I kind of hang out for that stuff. Um, Facebook, you can message me there if you really, you know, you need me for something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Offering work, that's always nice. (laughs) So for everybody listening, um, as always, whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on, the links to all Nicholas's stuff will be down below. So like he said, he's not super active on social media, which I think, to be honest, is a good thing in a lot of ways. But uh, (laughs) I will put his, his social media accounts in the description wherever you're listening to this and the link for the website. Um, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to do it again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, later this year, because I'll have a lot over at the yeah. end of this year. I have, should have a lot more to talk about because yeah. um, things will have come to fruition. And uh, it's um, it's been kind of surreal for me, to be honest, to talk with you and have such a, a kind of a candid and, and real conversation. Um, thank you. And I hope everybody enjoys it. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much indeed. Take care, Aaron. Thanks. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as one dollar. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. <laughs> <laughs>